So we're talking to Michael Kern, who developed a software that he's going to spend a lot of time telling you about, which is uh, for the vision impaired. And it's got an incredibly unique story. And what's especially unique about this is, at least for me, is I'm waiting for my dinner to be served. And he's just finished his breakfast on the other <laughs> side of the world in Australia. Good morning, Michael Curran. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's good to have you. Michael, I, I know your story, how you, you know, you, you met at a camp with your associate and, and uh, you guys were deep into music, a music camp. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of amazing that these kind of camp adventures uh, give birth to so much uh, that comes forward from uh, the disability community themselves. Uh, Judy Human, I spoke with her yesterday. She's one of our keynote speakers. You know, she got an idea at a camp that, you know, that equality, uh, you know, for disabled people value should be valued just as much as it is for able people. Yeah. Uh, it's very similar to uh, what you saw. It's kind of a fascinating story that starts with your story that starts with, you know, computer out of the box doesn't work for people with vision impairment. So how did you get on the ground that you're, you're, you're sitting on now? Where did this all, where did you get the idea? where did you get the inspiration from? Was it out of frustration or out of passion or out of empathy? Or was it all those things, Michael? I think it is based on a bit of empathy, but also a bit of life experience. Um, I was born uh, with a lot of medical issues, um, digestive problems, um, including um, being bl totally blind, etc. Um, and um, I was in and out of hospital for the first three years or so of my life with some pretty significant operations. And um, to be honest, when I was first born, doctors really didn't, really weren't sure whether I was going to survive. And um, but thank you, you know. But thanks to the, the doctors and my schooling and definitely my parents. Um, I certainly, you know, I, I got on in life. Um, I learned very quickly to fight for what I wanted. And, um, and I think that set me uh, on this sort of road of understanding that if I put in the effort and, um, you know, I have moment, momentum in my own life uh, and, and a belief in what I do, then I can achieve what what I want. Um, but then at the same time, looking around the world and looking at, and as I sort of grew up into adulthood and started to learn about the rest of the world and um, perhaps comparing the opportunities that I had versus perhaps what uh, a lot of other people may not have had, especially in the disability community, especially in the blindness community, um, I really wanted to make a difference somehow um, to, to everyone and give them the same opportunity because I learned, you know, pretty young that if I, had, you know, if you're given a chance at something, um, then, you know, you can contribute to society and feel good about it. So I think that's really where it, where it started for me. But I mean, of course, it's been a very long journey and it, you know, took me a very long time to Sort of learn that and process it you know a lot of it was probably subconscious in the beginning um but but nowadays that's how i see it i'm going to start from i'm going to start this dig, you know dive into this from where nvda stands today in terms of the usage across the globe tell me what your scorecard looks like today and we're going to go back from that so we have roughly speaking around 200,000 uh downloads of the, the product um you know each, each release we make um we know that mvda is being used in over 150 countries um we have translated or i should say the community has translated NVDA into over 51 languages. 
Um, and so, you know, it's being used in every part of the globe. I mean, just the other day, I was curious and had a look at, you know, the fact that there are currently six people using it in Afghanistan right now. I mean, and that's extremely significant for me to, to understand that, you know, um, to know, I mean, we don't know these users' stories or anything like that, but the fact that, you know, looking at, at a place like Afghanistan, or indeed I did the same thing five or so years back, looking at, you know, there were four or five people using it in Syria. I mean, this is real stuff. This is, um, you know, and that could be, uh, you know, make or break for, for certain blind people in terms of getting access to important information to make, you know, decisions, um, you know, about their life or about politics or, or whatever. Um, obviously, NVIDIA is used, um, you know, all around the world for, you know, um, education and gaining and keeping employment and to socialize and all that. But it's, but it's also, um, you know, it's also very humbling to, to see when it's used in, in, in particular countries as well, where, where um, the situation is, is pretty dire. Yeah, this is very dire. The prospect uh, of, of downloads on this, you guys decided to create a software that you were going to open, open access and, and free market, no cost involved. That boggles the mind. So, so you, how did you first seed this? Um, you know, I can understand building out donations at this point in time. And I know that you've got some important people on the corporate side that support you and, and they are, um, well, we'll get into that a little bit later. Oh. I wanna talk about how uh, voice and vision are now integrating uh, and what that means to the email business. But, uh, but for, for now, how did you see this? I mean, look, I think it really was, um, started simply as a, a pet project that was fun to do, just simply to see whether I could do it, you know, maybe almost to sort of just to prove it to myself as a very young adult, you know, um, I think I started at 23 or something like that. Um, and, um, you know, I was fairly comfortable. I'd just taken a break from university. I was on a, a blind pension uh, living with my girlfriend at the time, we had no children or anything like that. Um, you know, we, we were comfortable enough financially. Um, and um, I, you know, it was fun. I just wanted to try my hand at it. I had no idea whether it would succeed or not. It was just, just something to do. So I simply was volunteering my time, but simply just because I found it fun. And even my colleague, Jamie Tay, um, you know, jumped on board pretty soon after. He had another job, of course, at the time, um, but he, he used to spend his, he used to, um, in his lunch breaks, when he should have been resting and having lunch, he would be on the phone to me and coding and stuff with me at the same time on this project, because we both enjoyed it so much. Um, because, you know, it was partly just a sort of a, can we do it sort of thing, but also a, um, this kind of software we, as blind people ourselves uh, completely rely on. Um, and if, you know, we need to get it right so that we can actually use the computer ourselves. So you deliver a package or, you, or your, your people download it and then they do the, the, uh, the translations. You don't do that for them. That's right, that's right. Um, the translations are done by people in various you know, communities, various countries, language speaking communities. And they do it for free and they do it because they need it themselves. They're, they're motivated themselves. We're not, you know, forcing them to, paying them to, whatever. We're, they, they just, they, in fact, they originally came to us. I mean, I remember in 2006 when I first, maybe about, I don't know, five months into the project, um, you know, we got an email from someone in uh, Slovakia saying, look, I would really like to translate NVDA into my language. Um, can you, you know, can you make these, I think they were, you know, fairly small changes in NVDA so that we could enable them to uh, efficiently do, you know, uh, add translations into the project. We said, yeah, that's fine. Totally cool. And then, you know, the next one was uh, someone from Brazil and then it, you know, it sort of grew from there, but they were the ones, you know, people were coming to us saying, 
could we please translate for ourselves, you know? And that, that's what's happened for the last uh, 15 years or so. Do you do any kind of outreach, any kind of marketing, any, any uh, overseas market? Not that there isn't a big enough market in, in, uh, in Australia and in South Pacific too. Not commercially, um, you know, not, not in any, we don't really pay anyone or anything to, to get our you know, ads out there or anything, no advertising as such. It's really word of mouth. Um, we're very well these days connected in with the blind, yeah. the blindness community. You know, obviously, most people who are probably connected to the internet have at least heard of us. Um, uh, who are in the blindness community, um, you know, maybe half of them use us and half of them don't, and that's you know totally fine. Um, but yeah, yeah, people just tell each other. Um, well, of course, we do things such as you know this kind of interview or another you know, blindness related radio stations, things like that, of course. Um, but we don't deliberately go out there and, and commercially advertise. No, we've never done that. The World Health Organization claims 260 million, 280 million. I don't mm. know what the actual number is. Uh, mm -hmm. Vision impaired. Yeah. Um, does it, is it daunting to think uh, how extensive this can go? It is very. Um, yeah. We also, though, have to be, uh, I want to be clear that we're good at a, one particular thing, which is writing a particular piece of software and, you know, putting it out there so that people who can, uh, you know, can, can use it. Um, we don't really, you know, there are, I mean, you've just given that number. I mean, like, you know, so we have roughly 200,000 users, which is probably about estimation, which is probably about half of users, uh, bl blind users who um, definitely use computers all, all, all the time, which is you know only about four hundred thousand, but you're right. talking yeah. you know two hundred sixty million. Um, that it, it just goes to show how much work we still all have to do in terms of getting infrastructure and just hardware and stuff out to to people. Um, but also, though, it's fair to say that. You know, t taking a little bit more of a sort of a zoomed out look at this, that a lot of countries uh, and cultures have almost jumped over the computer revolution and have gone straight to to smartphones and things like that. So, at least in the small work that we do, um, we probably won't see a lot of those. You know, we probably won't touch a lot of those those people as they've gone on to. To phones there's probably work that we can do separately but it's not really to do with nvda as such nvda specifically is about making the the windows um, platform accessible to blind people yeah it was that was that was where i was going to go before when i thought about you know some of the the, the verbal technologies now that are that are uh, becoming so capturing um you know uh, alexa has kind of uh, kicked the dominoes over the have people thinking more about receiving their their emails in their ear rather than on their screen. What's your what's your take on that? Where do you where do you see that? Uh, it, it's clearly out there, and there's a whole lot of emails that are still on computers. I think it's an exciting time at the moment, and I think that um, I, I think there's sort of two parts to this. I think this kind of technology, certainly the verbal technology, is really great for everyone no matter what kind of you know whether they have a disability or, or not or what abilities they they do have that's very clear you know people, things like alexa and siri and all that are becoming extremely popular and used in many different um various ways i mean you know obviously you know i will use siri to ask what the weather is or whatever or someone might use alexa to read out a recipe or read out an email or something like that and that's great and that's totally changing the world I don't know, I'm not yet personally convinced how efficient that kind of stuff is in many different uh, aspects of daily work. Um, I think it's great when you're sort of mobile and out on the run or you're getting ready in the morning or you know, you're cooking a meal or something like that. I think that that kind of verbal uh, system is, is really useful and it's certainly changed my life and it's changed other people's lives. I'm not yet convinced that the sort of the, the, the latency and the sort of the input is necessarily perhaps 
as efficient as perhaps using a, a keyboard or some other form of device uh, or input device could be in terms of actually getting the job done. So do, doing really complex work um, or, you know, writing documents um, or even reading or, you know, um, very quickly trying to access a lot of complex information. So browsing a website. I'm sure that that will improve um, more and more, um, but I don't believe we're there yet um, at all, personally. But um, at the same time, the other aspect I think is worth looking at is that a lot of this kind of verbal technology has come about, even though it's used in the mainstream now, has come about through um, the needs uh, uh, of people with, with disabilities. And this happens all the time, you know, in terms of um, disability uh, causes innovation, um, you know, within the disability sector and then bleeds out into the mainstream. And I always find that extremely exciting, you know. So for instance, you know, um, research into speech synthesis and, you know, making um, speech output more clearer or even indeed speech input, um, you know, more accurate has all come from, from the needs of the disability community and then then come into the mainstream and everyone's, um, you know, now like, oh, this is useful. And that's really, you know, it's, it's almost a, I think it's almost a, a, a pride thing for people with disabilities, you know, whether, whether they, you know, we had anything uh, necessarily to do with it ourselves in terms of the making of it, but the fact that uh, we, we advocated and pushed for our own needs, and then it's also helped many, many more people. That's a, that's a great thing. It's, it's it's kind of a fascinating time. The conference that that we're coming up on in October, which you will be a part of, you know, is about empowering accessibility to businesses. You know, business kind of still resides as sort of the, the final frontier for the uh, accessibility issue to become part of a cultural change and part of a a, a, an equality that, uh, you know, free nations should be uh, operating under. Have you ever, have you, have you come across uh, any kind of resistance in any way to what you provide as, uh, have any of these countries that you mentioned before, uh, you know, you mentioned Syria and you mentioned yeah. Afghanistan, certainly these are, you know, totalitarian kinds of uh, government situations. Uh, do, you, do you find that it's it's difficult for people? Have you heard? Of, have you gotten any feedback at all that that uh, persons that want the freedom that you bring them are not allowed to have it? We haven't got like di direct uh, feedback like that. But if we look at, for instance, China, though. Our statistics, uh, at least from what we can track, are extremely low. We only, if we go by our statistics alone, we only have 200 to 400 users in China. And I don't believe that for a second. Um, so there's, there's trouble um, in order to, in getting those statistics. And no doubt that's just, you know, because they, they sort of have their internet firewalls and things like that, whatever they do. Um, and that's, you know, probably true, uh, for certain other countries as well. Um, so it's hard to work out what the situation really is. I do know in China that they have about at least four different screen reading products, similar to MVDA, most of them uh, probably commercial, uh, though, I, though it's possible the Chinese government may provide some of these to people for free. I, again, I don't really have the evidence, but, um, you know, but then at the same time, you know, we, we know that NVDA is certainly being used in Hong Kong and it's being used in Taiwan. And it's, you know, so um, we just don't know the situation in China. It could be bad, it could be okay. Um, so there's, there's probably other, you know, countries I can, you know, give similar examples to. Another um, situation is purely because we're open source, in the past there has been uh some you know nervousness and worry especially from governments about using our product because they believe that if something is open source and therefore it's not secure or it's not good enough um which to be honest is usually far from the truth because if something is open source anyone can audit the code um themselves uh and 
know, work out for themselves whether it's secure or not. Just because something is closed source doesn't mean for a second that it's any more secure. It simply just means we don't know. Um, and um, so, yeah, there has been that. But having said that, though, things are definitely changing now uh, in the government and in corporate world. I mean, now you have obviously, you know, Google sort of to come up, uh, started, you know, using a lot of open source products several years ago. Now we also see Microsoft is majorly changing its direction and is really embracing open source products such as Linux. Um, and I mean, it, it just bought GitHub, which is, you know, the, the main sort of huge code repository for, for millions of open source projects. Um, so I think the opinion is definitely changing. Um, so it's an exciting time and we'll um, see what happens. Yeah, it is. It's an exciting time for, for disabilities and, and, you know, the voice of society is, uh, is opening up and, and the younger generations are, uh, are going to have their way. Uh, they're not going to tolerate, I don't think they're going to tolerate uh, segregation uh, of uh, disabilities the way it's oh, been oh. segregated in the past. You know, it used to be, I mean, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but it's, oh. if, you know, if you mentioned, if you, if you were to call somebody a segregationist in this country, it would really be a problem. Uh, well, you know, what else is it if you, you know, if you're, if you're unwilling to open your head to accessibility for, for the disabled or to, you know, to live up to our, our nation's creed, e pluribus unum, from many, there is one, you know, uh, so it, it, it's, it's changing. It's changing almost to a person, every single one of the speakers uh, that I've, I've talked to about coming up in the conference and uh, in, in these sessions, you know, they, they all kind of agree that can't exactly define it, can't exactly prove it, but we know there's a moment, there's this change in the air. And, and I think part of that could be because of the pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. because of COVID. Everybody came through COVID surprised that there was no world collapse, that there was no society, you know, uh, that that fell off the uh, off the end of the earth. Uh, you know, we went through this long period of of, uh, of you know, in almost literal incarceration, and businesses survived, people mm -hmm. survived, yeah. even the disabled. In fact, the disabled may have gained a whole new respect because without the things that the able person had, they got it through, through it too. Yes. Uh, you know, they, they found a way to get their groceries and, and get to the doctors or get medications or accomplish, you know. Oh, by the way, you mean that disabled people are problem solvers? <laughs> yes, because they have to be exactly you know uh, you know that they're team players yes because they have to be they'd be pretty good people to have in business wouldn't they yeah. Yeah. so maybe it's just that maybe there's a whole lot of you know i mean when you look at i'm a great believer in in history i think it repeats itself continually when you look at the last great industrial revolution it was a hundred years ago uh, it began, you know, and it began out of a pandemic, you know, the mm -hmm. Spanish flu. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, what followed it was a couple of world wars and some other wars that should have been world wars that were not, mm. fortunately. Mm. But, uh, but it was after that, that we began automation and, you know, the industrial revolution and so forth. And, you know, technology is halfway through 100 years. Uh, 1971 was the first microprocessor introduced. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we are. Uh, we're talking about invisible technology that will open up and give vision to the blind and give hearing to the deaf. It's, it's kind of an amazing time. And it's all built on, you know, I'm also, you know, as publisher of, of accessibility, I believe that you know, accessibility is the turning house for everything that goes on. Uh -huh. All discovery, all science, all endeavor 
uh, anything that is produced for disabilities stops if accessibility doesn't become the meeting point oh. between the two things. You know, there's a need, there's a promise, you got to put them together. You got to make them accessible. I am astounded by uh, by the generosity of of uh, of the meaning of of what you've done, and uh, congratulate you and James. And I'm so glad that uh, that we had an opportunity to air your story. Uh, maybe we can help you get to the next two hundred thousand people. That'd be great. Thank you. That would be very good. And. Uh, to anybody that's watching this and has listened carefully, this is why accessibility matters.